my main role here is to introduce our three speakers, um, and we're really lucky today. When, when I arrived in Cambridge uh, to the zoology department in 1987, um, there was a young ge geography lecturer who had just arrived named Bill Adams. And he had the temerity, even though he was in the geography department and not in the zoology department where all of us thought the real conservationists were, to set himself up as, as, as the new leader of conservation science in Cambridge, and in particular to launch a, a really groundbreaking MSc program in conservation. And at that time, we were surprised because we couldn't figure out what did geography have to do with conservation. To us, conservation was, was biology. Um, since then, of course, we've learned that, that conservation is deeply caught up in the issues of international development, poverty alleviation, the problems of governance and equity and fairness around the world. And Bill has been at the forefront of that movement, which has revolutionized conservation. And um, all of us are really grateful to him for that. Uh, in spite of that, I've never had the opportunity to hear Bill speak before. So this is as exciting an opportunity for me as it is for all of you. Um, very recently, Bill was elevated to uh, the position of the first Marin Professor of Conservation and Development at Cambridge University. And we're really honored to have him speak to us today about conservation and poverty around the world. Bill. Thank you very much indeed, James. And thank you all for coming and giving me this opportunity to speak to you. The subject I want to talk to you about today is one that uh, is undoubtedly uh, at the forefront of conservation thinking worldwide, but it's also something I think which uh, puts together two uh, very critical issues for the 21st century. The conservation challenge of the coming century, the century we're just starting, is huge. Um, the human impact on the biosphere, uh, the, the things that we demand uh, from the other living organisms on Earth is uh, enormous and rising. Here are the, some of the sorts of statistics that have been coming out over the last 10 or 20 years. 40% of the potential terrestrial net primary production is co-opted or used by humans in some way. Getting up towards that was in 1986. Now it will be up towards half. Half of everything that the green plants produce on Earth we use. Now that's an enormous conversion of the biosphere to human purposes. 75% of the habitable Earth is disturbed by human activity, some of it hugely disturbed and some of it repeatedly uh, in industrialized countries. And uh, Vitusek writing here in 1997 in Science says, the rate, scales, kinds, and combinations of changes happening now are fundamentally different from those at any other time in history. And this is the phrase I like, we're changing the Earth more rapidly than we're understanding it. And that is despite this huge growth in uh, scientific capacity. The Earth is changing faster than we're understanding it. And lastly, to go with the, the picture of the, the, the huge tuna, uh, a reminder that the global population of large predatory fish is down to about 10% at pre-industrial levels. And when you talk to conservationists about that uh, challenge, uh, they talk about an extinction spasm. Uh, Edward Wilson here, writing in Diversity of Life, uh, his book published in the early 1990s, talks about this period of the end of the 20th and the start of the 21st century as being one of a, a historic uh, a spasm of extinction, equivalent to that of, of other periods of geological history, like the, uh, the, the, the extinction of the dinosaurs. And talking about the, the way in which human activities have uh, driven extinction rates up by between 100 and 10,000 times. Now, that's the conservation position, and it's uh, a very significant one. It's the reason why organizations like, like James's, the Wildlife Conservation Society, and many others, are trying to uh, emphasize to world leaders uh, the importance of biodiversity conservation. As they do so, they come up against the fact that many of the places they want to conserve, many of the places we want to conserve, are in very poor countries. Not only are they in poor countries, but the, the, the species and habitats that we want to preserve are the places where the poorest people live. And so poverty and conservation uh, are no longer things that one can deal with entirely separately. They're not a left brain and a right brain problem. You have to do them both together. 
So what I'm going to try to do today is to uh, run through a set of, of five questions. I want to say something about what poverty is. I want to say something about uh, what the impact is of development on poverty, uh, say something about the success with which we're dealing with global poverty. I then want to talk about how important biodiversity is to the poor. Is this a matter that biodiversity is an issue only for rich people? When you become wealthy, then you start to care about wildlife, but until you're wealthy, you don't. Fourthly, I want to look at what the impact is of development on biodiversity. If you undertake development programs in order to cut poverty, does that inevitably damage biodiversity? And lastly, I want to look at the impacts of conservation on poverty. And I realize that what I've done is to set out a, a very confusing agenda. Um, and if you end up feeling like this, then I'm very sorry. Um, but uh, the point about this diagram is that everything connects to everything else. OK, let me start off and talk about what is poverty. At its simplest, I think this quote from Thabo Mbeki, uh, the South African um, president, uh, catches it. It's the most critical challenge facing South Africa in its next 10 years of democracy. The picture, of course, is of Aceh, not of, uh, not of uh, South Africa, and one of the results of the uh, tsunami. It's a critical problem. It's a critical problem for South Africa, but for every other world leader. It's even an issue, a critical issue, for many developed economies, industrialized economies. Poverty is a, pr uh, a high agenda item. What is it? Well, here's a definition uh, from the World Bank, from its uh, poverty net, uh, and it's a description of poverty, and it dis demonstrates the multidimensional nature of it. Poverty is not simply a matter of how many dollars or pounds you have in your pocket. He says here, it's hunger, it's lack of shelter, it's being sick and not being able to see a doctor. It's not being able to go to school and not knowing how to read. Poverty is not having a job, it's fear for the future, living one day at a time, losing a child to illness brought about by unclean water. Poverty is powerlessness, lack of representation and freedom. It's a multidimensional uh, problem. And to give you some sort of statistics on it, uh, the f figures at the bottom uh, talk about your, the chances of those born in a tropical African dryland country today. Someone born in the middle of the Sahel uh, or Ethiopia or uh, perhaps Zimbabwe. You'd have a one in seven in ten chance of dying before you reach the age of five. That's a huge loss of human potential. A four in ten chance of being stunted in your growth as a child. A six in ten chance only of access to health services. You have a 5 in 10 chance of access to improved water. This is what poverty means. And the, and the logistic challenge of meeting this, the cost, uh, the, the uh, requirements in terms of expertise, is absolutely huge. How do we measure poverty? Well, the classic thing is to measure uh, incomes or consumption levels. But the difficulty with this is the fact that, of course, buying power and aspirations are very different in different places. So a lot of people talk about uh, this, uh, if, you, if you look at the World Bank or one of these other uh, major organizations, they talk about it in terms of uh, the, the basic needs that uh, uh, communities have. That varies in different places. The basic needs of someone in New York are different because the circumstances are different from the basic needs of someone in Bangladesh. The bottom line that people often use is, as a reference line is something like uh, the $1 or $2 a day purchasing power parity. Uh, and it's a measure, roughly, a, a way of developing comparative numbers across the world in terms, of, uh, in terms of poverty. And these data are for 1999, but it's not so very different now. It's just under 1.2 billion people out of the 6 billion on Earth uh, have consumption levels below a dollar a day. And uh, something like 2.8 billion, nearly half, are living on $2 a day. And it is extremely difficult when you live in an industrialized economy like the USA or like the UK uh, to imagine what that, sort of, what that constraint uh, is like. But this is the, the constraint of many people who are the immediate neighbors of, uh, of conservation projects in the developing world. It's not just a matter of income. Uh, there's many other sorts of measures you can use. This is one from the UNDP Human Development Index. It's life expectancy at birth. Uh, these are the favored countries of the Earth. The USA is down here, about number six or seven, with a life expectancy of about 77 years at birth across the whole country. On the other side of the bottom, uh, the poorest countries on the uh, Human uh, Development Index, many of them, as you see in sub-Saharan Africa, with life expectancies down to 35 years at birth. Now, many of these countries are actually uh, in this position because of particular difficulties. At the time of these data, for example, Sierra Leone was in the middle of a disastrous civil war. 
Um, but nonetheless, uh, you can see something of the differential. And of course, most conservationists, most of the money for conservation, comes from people who live in these countries. And much of the, of the biodiversity that they're interested in conserving is in those countries. So you have to think that there's a real challenge as to how the conservation message can get out, not just across uh, developed nations, but how it can be shared globally in ways that are effective and also uh, equitable. And if you map the statistics, you get some sense uh, that this is not a uniform uh, characteristic. It's not that everybody in the developing world is equally poor. Uh, you get a very different sort of pattern. Here, for example, you have per capita gross domestic product. This is what happens if you work out the size of the economy and divide it by the, the number of people in the country uh, for uh, sub-Saharan Africa, the whole of Africa. Uh, and you find particular countries like the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, in the middle, uh, particularly, uh, particularly badly off. Can I make this thing work? I'm not sure I can be do that. Um, if you look at the middle, it's adult literacy rates. The Congo fades away, but other countries in the Sahel uh, pick up uh, with adult literacies of between 13 and 19 percent, an extraordinary lack of, uh, of human expertise, if you like, because of that. And then life expectancy on the right, and you can see a number of countries there popping up. In that instance, it will be issues like AIDS uh, starting to drive life expectancies. And if you look globally at issues like uh, childhood malnutrition, uh, you get uh, this sort of picture. You get continents like Africa standing out uh, for the, the, the number of countries uh, where childhood malnutrition is uh, very serious. The, uh, the coloring here shows the percentage of children aged one to five who are underweight. Uh, and the darkest color is that where 50% of uh, children are underweight. And you can see that uh, the Horn of Africa, the Sudan, bits of the Sahel, and parts of the Indian subcontinent very seriously uh, are challenged by childhood malnutrition. So all these attributes of poverty are really very significant uh, challenges for national governments. And they're challenges precisely uh, in the places, uh, or many, in many instances, in the places where conservationists most wish to work. What are the impacts of uh, development on poverty? Well, the key thing to talk about probably is the Millennium Development Goals, which were uh, agreed at the turn of the millennium. Uh, eight goals which all governments across the world signed up to, uh, the first of which simply is to eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. There have been pushes like this before, like the 1960s, for example, the so-called development decade. But here, the idea was that you would get all governments to focus on this. Uh, developing world governments to focus on the poverty aspects of their national policies, and developed and wealthy countries are concentrating on finding the resources uh, to pay for this sort of thing. And I've put this one in red because it's interesting to see that environmental sustainability is here as one of the eight goals. Uh, I think many conservation people would feel it ought to be a stronger in a stronger position than that. Nonetheless, it underpins, arguably, a number of the other things, as I'll say in a minute. So the Millennium Development Goals are agreed. There's a huge effort going into trying to, uh, make, to achieve these goals by 2015. Uh, but even if they're met in full, there will still be about 900 million people, uh, who, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa and, and South Asia, whose poverty is intractable, who are still living at the rate of $1 and $2 a day. So even if we're successful as an international community, we still have a huge challenge. We are experiencing some uh, success. Uh, this diagram separates the countries towards the right uh, and the bottom of the diagram uh, where poverty has decreased uh, since 1990 and the ones in the top left where poverty has increased. And you can see a number of places, particularly East Asia and South Asia, where poverty has been reduced. And you can see others, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, where uh, it's, it's still increasing. So you've got different geographical patterns in the success of, of uh, poverty alleviation globally. And this is uh, the sort of data that people are generating. This is from the World Resources uh, Institute. And you can see that uh, in some parts of the world, like East Asia and the Pacific, the percentage of the population living below a dollar a day is declining quite fast. A lot of that is down to China. Um, so the poverty alleviation is working really well there. Other parts of the world, it's not working well at all. If you look at the line that ends up on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, the top, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, you can see that the level is flatlining. If anything, it's, it's rising. So there are places where development is reducing poverty, and there are places where it's not. 
Overall, I suppose you could say we're not doing too badly. Uh, there's been a decline uh, from 39% uh, to 21% uh, in the proportion of people living on less than a dollar a day globally. But if you look at where that is, a uh, large part of that gain is in countries like uh, China uh, and South Asia, both of which have seen reductions, while other regions of the world, uh, it goes up. So is development, um, is development cutting poverty? Well, yes, it is to an extent, um, but it's not uh, successful everywhere. And there is going to be left with this uh, residual problem of chronic poverty, this, these data from the Chronic Poverty Research Center, talking about these 900 million people, people who are locked into poverty and are likely to remain so, people who have been poor for years, often since birth, uh, and for whom poverty is an inheritance passed down the generations. So does development reduce poverty? Yes, it does, but not always and not for everyone. And it depends rather how you measure it. There's issues of equity uh, and uh, quality of life and so on. So we have a problem of poverty. It's a, very, it's a global problem. It's something which is being addressed and with some success, more success in some places than others. What does that have to say to us about uh, the conservation challenge? How important is biodiversity to the poor? And there are various sorts of estimates which talk about uh, one to 200 million uh, people having a significant dependence on wildlife, either f in the form of forests and forest resources or wild meat or indirectly for tourism, for food, their food security and livelihoods. So out of the six billion people on Earth, about 150 million are depending directly on wildlife. That's a significant number. It's not an overwhelming number uh, by any means. And if you look at analyses of the assets of the rural poor, if you look at those parts of the developing world where the majority of poor people uh, are living in rural areas, you can see a number of assets of which natural capital uh, is one of the, one of the significant uh, elements. The land, the water, the living resources are underpinning uh, the resources of the poor in, for example, areas uh, of pastoral land, areas of, uh, of farmland. So it is significant, but it's one among five forms of capital that people talk about, including, obviously, financial capital is what we're used to are thinking about capital markets, uh, physical capital like infrastructure, like the dam in the middle of the picture, human capital, uh, labor, skills, knowledge, good health. This is human capital uh, in the making, in the development, and if those kids are healthy and they survive and they become educated, then you've created, uh, you've created human capital by investing in them. And lastly, social capital, their capacity, uh, people's capacity to network and work together. These are, the, these are the resources of the poor, and natural capital has its rightful place uh, among them. So here, for example, are some statistics from Botswana uh, looking at the richest and the poorest 20% among a rural community. And in a sense, all of these people are using the natural environment and its derivatives in, in various sorts of ways. I probably can't see this very well. It doesn't look very good from here. But the richest 20% on the right, the biggest way in which they use the environment is for livestock grazing. They're wealthy, they own cattle, uh, and they use the environment for, for livestock grazing. But look at what the poorest 20% are using. They do have a few livestock, but only a very tiny proportion. But they're using it for collecting construction materials, for making crafts, for firewood, which they sell, uh, and for wild fruits and vegetables, which they eat. And so the natural environment in its diversity is particularly significant to the poorest within the rural community and the poorest among the poor. And so there is a sense in which the diversity of natural environments is very uh, much linked to the capacity of the poor to look after themselves. It's also true that, in a sense, all of us depend on the functioning of the natural environment in terms of ecosystem, ecosystem services. Uh, this is a, a diagram taken from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment uh, done in 2005, talking about the different kinds of services which the biosphere provides, supporting services like nutrient cycling, soil formation, etc., provisioning services at the top, the ones that the people, the poor in Botswana, were using, food, fresh water, wood and fiber, fuel, regulating services like climate regulation, flood regulation, disease regulation, water purification, this is the sector I think we're most, uh, are becoming most aware of uh, as we uh, come to terms with climate change, uh, anthropogenic climate change. And lastly, a set of important uh, but often forgotten services, uh, of cultural services, um, the pleasure, the aesthetic pleasure uh, people get from, from nature, spiritual, educational, recreational uh, uh, services. <clears throat> 
Uh, and it's wrong to think that poor people only use provisioning services. They don't experience these. Uh, that would be a mistake. Uh, it's often uh, a, a mistake people often make. And the Millennium Ecosystem Report uh, quite rightly says uh, that uh, progress in addressing the goals of poverty and hunger eradication, etc., are unlikely to be sustained if ecosystem services uh, continue to be degraded. And this is the sort of diagram they, they draw with the uh, various links uh, between the services uh, and the uh, constituents of human well-being. And uh, you can see that all the services uh, affect uh, security, the basic material necessary for a good life, uh, health, and good social relations. And we need those things, uh, but so do people in the Sahel or in the jungles of, uh, uh, of uh, Gabon or Vietnam. And so the ecosystem services, in a general sense, does do underpin uh, the livelihoods of the poor, just as they underpin uh, the well-being of the wealthy, like ourselves. And you can get some sense as to how we, uh, we also are exposed to this. An example which uh, I thought would bring it slightly closer to home. This is a, a problem of uh, nutrients uh, running into shallow seas and generating, uh, um, in this case, anoxic conditions. And the, the outflow from the Mississippi system uh, in the Gulf of Mexico produces a very large dead zone uh, off that coast um, every year uh, in, uh, the, in spring with consequent impacts on uh, capacity to support fisheries and so on. So we're not impervious, even, even when we live in urban areas, uh, we're not independent in any sense of these kinds of ecosystem uh, service impacts. So how important is biodiversity to the poor? Well, it, it secures well-being for all. Um, it underpins livelihoods uh, for, for some. But it's most important to the poorest. Uh, there are real questions as to whether it it's, can ever provide more than a safety net. Um, and it's not clear uh, how important it is to the rising numbers of urban poor. But nonetheless, it's clear uh, that biodiversity uh, does, if you like, underpin the capacity of the poor to escape from poverty or to survive poverty. So there ought to be a natural uh, um, collaboration, you might think, between conservation uh, and, uh, um, and the poor and poverty alleviation as, as two objectives. However... Uh, it's clear that uh, many of the things that we do in the name of both poverty alleviation and of development and of improving uh, the way in which the world generates the benefits we want, many of those things are very destructive. I've put the, the uh, plug for the film. We took all our students from the geography department to see this. We booked a cinema and had a special showing. It was quite an entertaining, entertaining morning. I don't know if you've seen it yet, but if you haven't, um, it's definitely worth very, quite thought-provoking had some interesting reactions from the, from the undergraduates. Um, that was the old art cinema in Cambridge, which is still staggering on in one form or another. <laughs> um, so the sorts of things that we're aware of, population growth, the rise of global population to 6 billion and rising, well, they predict it might stabilize at between 9 and 12 billion. That's a huge uh, challenge uh, to the capacity both of the biosphere to provide the things that people need, but also, of course, uh, to the capacity of uh, governments and people themselves to meet their own needs. Patterns of consumption, uh, like our desire to consume uh, infinitely large, uh, seemingly infinitely large quantities of oil uh, in our motor cars and our aeroplanes flying across the Atlantic to give lectures and other bizarre activities uh, like that. Uh, we think we can do that kind of thing without impact, and it's becoming clear that we can't. It's fantastic to be able to do it, but it has an impact, and those impacts are quite significant. Patterns of industrialization which uh, have, have generated such enormous wealth and which still have the capacity to generate wealth, but also generate all kinds of unwanted side effects directly through pollution, indirectly through uh, problems of waste disposal and so forth. Uh, Cambridge, as you will remember, is a very flat place, but it has a number of new hills, and the new hills are basically rubbish. Uh, there's a big one on the side of the road up to Ely off the A10. And as you drive along, you think, that's interesting. That didn't used to be there. And it's simply a hill, full of, a hill of rubbish uh, covered over with grass. Uh, and these kinds of, uh, this throwaway society, which we have in the UK, uh, just as I think you do in the US, is uh, indicative, I think, of the problems we have here. And the challenges of urbanization, when you get millions of people living together, the challenges of dealing with their impacts become quite serious. 
uh, and uh, so forth. How do you measure this? Well, this is from the latest uh, Living Planet report, um, and it looks at the humanity's ecological footprint. The work comes from the Global Footprint Network and dates back to uh, the book by Wackenackel and Rees uh, from the 1990s in the rather nice diagram in the top right-hand corner, which shows uh, a little high-rise city, as it were, New York, up at the top, not taking up a large part of the Earth's surface. But, of course, its capacity, our capacity living in these cities to suck in resources, means that our ecological impact is very much greater. And this map down here uh, is a, a, uh, um, an attempt to re present the countries of the world in terms of their ecological footprint. The darkest t shade here, which includes uh, the USA and much of Northwest Europe, uh, we're using uh, about f equivalent of five and a half hectares per person. And poor old Africa shrinks uh, down to almost nothing um, because they don't consume very much, and they don't consume very much because they haven't got very much money. Um, the challenge, of course, is uh, to try and uh, uh, develop a quality of life without copying uh, the, uh, the more excessive dimensions of European or North American consumption patterns. And so attempts at development are very uh, creative in terms of creating wealth, but also quite, uh, quite destructive. One of the ways that people draw, uh, draw this out, and they talk about, economists talk about a Kuznets curve, an environmental Kuznets curve, uh, where you have, um, uh, as per capita income, national income rises, you get increasing uh, environmental degradation. So typically, for example, in somewhere like China at the moment, air quality in cities is declining quite rapidly because of the rise in motor cars. And people are getting, they're getting more and more smogs and on-street on street, um, pollution. But they say if you look at the richest countries, um, let's say the USA or, or European countries, you find that the streets have cleaned themselves up again. So London in the 1950s had smogs, and London is now quite a clean city um, because we've moved all the polluting things away and we've put new uh, technologies in place. So people say, this is what happens. It's no problem. It's a bit, a bit rough for a few years, but eventually it sorts itself out uh, down there. And people talk about tunneling. Uh, maybe you could get China from here to there without having to go through the nasty peak at the top if we share technologies. Fantastic. Why don't we give them the, the new, low, new uh, low emission vehicles and so on? Uh, and that's, by the way, it's the Buntsfield fire that went up in Hemel Hempstead uh, in uh, December a year ago. Uh, sort of, to me, a kind of reminder of the difficulties uh, associated with our insatiable appetite for oil. Um, and people talk about this capacity for tunneling through and the capacity for industrial efficiency uh, to improve, uh, to, to do away with some of these sorts uh, of difficulties. And there are other sorts of things we're familiar with uh, in the development process. The one, the obvious one to mention is energy. Uh, this is energy use in the USA from 1650 to 2000. Um, and it's extraordinary how long the history of low energy use is. But look at it, in the 19th century, it starts to pop up, moving through a series of fuels from wood to coal to, uh, to petroleum eventually. And with that, of course, uh, we have, especially with the use of petroleum, we have the conventional ski jump uh, in carbon dioxide and that story about, uh, the story about climate change. And the human CO2 production, um, but since 1975, equaled the entire previous human outputs. And so we have achieved our development. We've done it, obviously, at a considerable cost. And it's worth noting that 2 billion people still have no access to electricity or other modern energy supplies. So if they're successful in getting it, and in order to reduce their poverty, we're probably going to try and make that happen, that these impacts are going to get considerably worse. So poverty alleviation, development, uh, and the environment are linked together in quite complex and difficult sorts of ways. Of course, uh, this is recognized, and we have a whole uh, 20 or 30 years now talking about sustainability and sustainable development. Uh, from the 1960s, uh, when the Conservation Foundation ran a conference on uh, technology and international development, right through to the 2002 summit uh, in Johannesburg. And we're used to talking about, uh, co about sustainable development as a dynamic process which enables people, this is a definition from Forum for the Future, which is a UK charity, and I quite like it as a definition, a process which enables people to realize their potential and improve their quality of life in ways which simultaneously protects and enhance the Earth's life support systems. Fantastic if we could achieve it. The problem is we don't really know how to achieve it. We don't know how to get to this desirable sort of state. So does development damage the environment? Does it cause biodiversity loss? Well, yes, it does. 
the process of development, the process that's brought wealth to the uh, industrialized West, is inherently destructive as well as creative. We know that. We live with it every day. We live with the arguments about whether particular sorts of factories or plants or urban development should be built. We know it's destructive. We know it's creative. Some environmental measures improve with wealth. For example, air pollution, that's demonstrated many times. Some do not. Biodiversity does not. Biodiversity does not improve when you get over the other side of the Kuznets curve. There doesn't seem to be a Kuznets curve for biodiversity. We simply use it up. Uh, we take away the places that are biodiverse and we build cities on them, or we build factories on them. And they don't come back, at least they don't come back in the same sort of way. Now, none of this would matter particularly if it wasn't for the fact that, in practice, conservation itself has impacts on poverty. And I want to say something about this. And it's not, I'm not saying this as a, an attack on conservation because uh, I'm very actively involved in it. But I think it's a wake-up call to remember just how difficult it is to deliver conservation on the ground, the conservation of the natural world, without, uh, also, without having adverse impacts uh, on the poor. And here are, are three uh, quotes from recent papers arguing about whether poverty uh, and alleviation and conservation are at war with each other. The first is from uh, the book by John Oates, uh, Myth and Reality in the Rainforest, a very passionate book about rainforest primate conservation. And he's doesn't, he, would, he greatly dislikes the phrase sustainable development, and he says excessive emphasis on development can lead to a de-emphasis of conservation goals to the extent they're no longer seriously addressed. And what he's really worried about is conservation organizations that pretend to be doing development. They go into a piece of rainforest and they start uh, running development projects in the hope that if people become wealthy, they will stop, uh, um, particularly in his case, stop hunting uh, the, the wildlife in the forest. And he says it just doesn't work. That's his claim. Uh, here are uh, Stephen Sarnison and Kent Redford of WCS, Wildlife Conservation Society, uh, point, pointing a finger at the poverty alleviation movement and saying in its new incarnation, it's largely subsumed or supplanted conservation. The trend has gone unnoticed, but it poses a significant threat to conservation objectives. And what they're basically saying is, if you're interested in protecting the biosphere, you ought to get on with that job. You shouldn't be distracted by the equally significant but different agendas of, of, of reducing poverty. At the same time, you've got two, uh, two British social scientists here. Uh, Dillis Rowe works for the International Institute for Environment and Development in London, and Joe Elliott actually works for Wildlife works for um, African Wildlife Foundation uh, nowadays, but she's saying here, poor people should not pay the price for biodiversity protection. So you can see the sort of the nature of the debate. Uh, what, is the, what is the impact that they're all talking about? Well, it's about whether you can achieve uh, a win-win solution, whether you can achieve economic growth, which brings wealth, uh, in order to cut uh, poverty uh, without damaging biodiversity. And the argument is uh, that you, if you want to protect biodiversity, you have to focus on that as a goal. Uh, but if you do that, you, have, you run the risk of hurting the poor, and you also run the risk of uh, inconveniencing or reducing economic growth. And we're used in developed, developed countries, industrialized countries, to seeing this argument, this axis argued about, with, let us say, a government wishing to start drilling for oil in place X, which is full of wildlife, uh, and the Wildlife Conservation Society is urging them not to on the grounds that it's a, a wilderness refuge. We're used to that debate. What I'm saying is that in the developing world, there's a third axis, and it's quite a complex one. Hmm. I hate it when I've done this to a slide. So let's quickly look at the benefits and costs of conservation. These are the benefits. There are direct consumptive uses. You can eat, chop down, uh, uh, and consume wildlife. There are benefits from ecotourism. Uh, you can base tourist enterprises on wildlife, and they generate, uh, can generate quite significant incomes. Um, biodiversity can generate uh, localized services like water or erosion control. Um, we're very familiar with the fact that if you chop, the argument that if you chop trees down, chop a forest down, you get reduced water intake. Uh, you get dispersed services uh, globally. Um, we produce lots of carbon because we release it from hydrocarbons, um, and it's all soaked. What, some of it's soaked up. Um, some of it's soaked up by tropical uh, tropical forests. And so, in a sense, those forests provide a global serv global service, which some estimates make uh, say is very big. And there are other sorts of economic values, other sorts of values from the existence of wildlife. So there are benefits from biodiversity conservation. <clears throat> 
Who receives those? Well, um, the consumptive uses are mostly fairly local. Ecotourism is split, really, between the local, the national, the global benefits. Uh, the economic benefits from tourist activities are um, often cornered by the people who book the tours, the people who design and build the aircraft and uh, uh, provide the fuel and everything else. But some of that stays at local level. But it's these big ones, the dispersed services and the option existence and bequest values uh, that are mostly shared at the global level. So who benefits from global conservation? Well, everybody to some extent, but actually quite a lot of the benefits are at global level. Uh, and that's, a, that's a, uh, something that a number of people have, have commented on. So that, for example, there are local benefits. Um, here, for example, uh, some numbers from Uganda about uh, wildlife tourism to go and uh, walk in the forest and, and look for groups of habituated gorillas. Um, and in this instance, it's quite successful. Uh, there are thousands of tourists every year in this one little national park in the bottom left-hand corner of Uganda, and they generate uh, hundreds of thousands of US dollars equivalent in revenue per year. And the Uganda Wildlife Service has created a, a system whereby that, some of that money, a proportion of that money, is plowed back into the local community. But when you see this kind of revenue being generated, it has an interesting effect because there's a lot of different people want to lay their hands on that money. The first group and the ones who would be most, in, most one might think, had the best claim were the people who used to live in what is now the park. Uh, over the 20th century, people moved into the former, um, the former wildlife, uh, wildlife sanctuary, um, which was illegal, but they still did it. And they were thrown out in the 1990s when the park was created. And logically, you would think, well, they, they are very poor, and they have lost land, even though they perhaps shouldn't have been there. They didn't know that. Uh, so they would you know, be proper claimants for the money. But they aren't necessarily the people who actually owned that farmland. The people who were actually thrown out were often clients for urban uh, uh, businessmen who had staked plots in what became the National Park. And those businessmen say, actually, we've got the title deeds to that property, so you ought to pay us. Don't pay the person we put on the land, but pay us. The district council says, well, this is all very well, but there's lots of poor people in this district. Why should you pay the people who were farming in the park? They shouldn't have been there anyway. You should give this money to the district, and we'll put it into schools and roads and everything. The Uganda Wildlife Authority says, OK, it's, we're generating $100,000 a year, but this is the only park that can do this in Uganda. Actually, there are two or three others. Haven't got a huge tourist industry. We must share this money out across our national parks. Uh, we must use that money uh, to, uh, to spread across the national parks in Uganda, or we can use it to promote conservation nationally. The park is on the border of Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And if the, if the gorillas spoke, uh, uh, spoke uh, they would probably speak French uh, and not, uh, one of the, not English, certainly, uh, because they were actually habituated uh, in Rwanda. So arguably, they're Rwandan gorillas, uh, and Rwanda's a country that needs this income. So you generate the resources locally, but there's an awful lot of potential claimants uh, for those resources. To this. Sorry, I'm conscious of time. So there are benefits which are shared in various sorts of ways of conservation. There are also costs, uh, and this is something which has come under a lot of attention, particularly from anthropologists and human rights groups. There are, in many instances, direct costs from conservation on, on local people through displacement, either through um, people being moved out or people being uh, prevented uh, from using resources. Uh, in, in these sorts of ways. So, uh, for example, people who lose their homes or their land or their resources, like those farmers in, in, uh, around the National Park in, uh, in Uganda, or lost opportunity for future use of land, or loss of non-use values, people who have um, cultural sites within the, within the forest. Uh, and there are arguments that evictions create very significant uh, difficulties in these areas. And there are also costs to be living next to a national park, like crop raiding and physical attack and so on. Who bears those passive costs? Well, most of those are, bear, are born locally, uh, not nationally or globally. So you have an inequality, if you like, uh, between the, national, uh, the local cost bearing of costs uh, and the, um, the, uh, the national, international and global benefits. And so I suppose, I'm, I hope I'm not leaving you completely confused. I suppose what I want to uh, leave you with thinking about is that conservation has to work within a framework of poverty and poverty alleviation. What impacts do conservation have on poverty? Globally, it's mostly positive. 
Um, we conserve ecosystems, and those ecosystems underpin human welfare. Locally, it's often negative. Uh, and we have to do something as conservation organizations. We have to do something about uh, those negative impacts. The economic benefits from conservation are not equally shared, and we need new mechanisms to improve, the, uh, improve uh, equity. It's possible to imagine them, but they're not there at the moment. The people who support conservation are basically the, the, the world's wealthy people, and those who, who support the wildlife are, uh, in many instances, the world's poor. And we need to get this challenge sorted out. Uh, so I think that the, the bottom line that, that I want to leave you with is an awareness that... Uh, conservation uh, is, I think, one of the great challenges of the 21st century, and it sits alongside the other one, which is poverty, poverty alleviation. We have to get these two things right, and we have to solve them in ways that solving one, improving one, doesn't make the other one worse. And I don't think we have models yet for how to do that, and that integration, I think, is the big challenge uh, for the next 100 years. Thanks very much. Thank you.